We've all got favorite offertory music. I suspect, I think that might have been one of mine. Thank you, Dana. If you've got your Bible this morning, then turn with me to Psalm 22. In just a second, I'll invite you to follow along with me as I read that psalm. I want to just warn you before we do read it together, we are going to read the whole psalm. It is 31 verses. There's intention behind that. I know that general practice is you get five to seven verses. That'll hold people's attention. We need all 31 verses this morning. I promise it's not my first time in church, so I'm asking you to listen to all 31 verses. You'll have 20 minutes after that to plan your lunch. Listen to the 31 verses. Hear the 31 verses. Focus on what we read together, and then... I'll begin the message, and then you can figure out what you want to have for lunch. Deal? All right. And follow along. I'll start reading there in Psalm 22, starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night... But find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, and they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Let me ask you something. What are you supposed to do with a psalm like that? What are you supposed to do with a psalm like that? And we know what to do with the next one, with Psalm 23, 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads, leads me beside still waters. He quiets my soul. Crochet that onto a pillow, you're good to go. We know what to do with Psalm 23. We know what to do with Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You put that one to music. That's pretty, pretty clear. We know what to do with songs like that. But what do you do with this one? This psalm's a lot more complicated than those, isn't it? Because it, it bounces between abandonment and assurance between woe and worship. The images that it evokes are not of green pastures or still waters, but of wild animals surrounding you, of you wasting away. This is not a psalm that I would particularly want to put to music because if you did so, you'd have to have a verse about verses 14 and 15 about being Pour out like water about your bones being out of joint, about your heart like wax melted within your breast, mouth dried up, on and on and on, and nobody wants to sing that. That's the verse that we Baptists would skip. That'd be verse 3 out of 4. I mean, this psalm, it, it ends triumphantly. It ends leaving you feeling good, but you've got to take a long walk to get there. So what do you do with it? We could always just skip it, I suppose. After all, the book of Psalms, it's a, it's a song book. It's the song book of the people of Israel. It's their, their hymnal, you might say. And we skip hymns all the time. We skip songs that we don't care for all the time. Do it in church, do it in life. In my car out in the parking lot, my radio has three preset stations. They're the only three I ever listen to. And when I don't like the song that's playing, I just go to the next station. And if I don't like that one, I go to the station after that. We skip songs we don't like all the time. So maybe we could just skip this song. Just pretend it's not even there. But the Jews of Jesus' day, we know, <clears throat> didn't do that. They didn't skip this one. This was a regular part of their temple worship. Both public and private. They read it aloud, just as you heard me read it aloud. They prayed it to God individually. This was one they knew. This was their just as I am. This was their amazing grace, one that they heard and sung and recited so many times it was just a part of their vocabulary. It was part of worship for them. Because of that, it's no surprise, really, that this psalm gets quoted in some way or another 24 times in the New Testament. Not only that, it's a psalm that Jesus himself quoted from the cross. With one of his dying breaths, this psalm came to mind for our Lord. But it's probably too important to skip. It's probably one we're going to have to address. We're going to have to deal with what's in this psalm. So what do we do with it? I suppose we could just focus on the pretty parts because they're there. There's a lot of sunshine in this psalm. There are words of blessed assurance. There's a call to worship. At the end, there's even a promise of cosmic restoration of all coming before the Father in worship. So we can read it and just read the nice parts and ignore the bad parts. You just have to read it right. Let me, let me show you how you might go about that. Starting in verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? I know this. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. You can read it like that. Just, just downplay the ugly parts. Truth is, we do that all the time when we read the Bible. We focus on the parts that bring us assurance. We dwell on the parts that make us feel good. And we try not to think too hard about the parts that are more difficult. Think about it. Think about the story of Noah. 
That's a story about God destroying the world. That's a story about God looking out at his creation and saying, they have messed it up so much that I'm going to lay waste to the whole thing and start over. That's the story. That's the headline. And that is terrifying. But the way we teach that story is about how God saved Noah's family. We sleep easier at night thinking about that part of the story. Or how about, a little further on, the story of David and Bathsheba. David's great sin. Not the sin of adultery, which was bad, but the sin of murder that followed. Putting Bathsheba's husband on the front lines to ensure that he would be killed. To try to cover up his crime. To cover up his sin. When we tell that story... We try not to think too hard about the consequences, about how Uriah died as a result, about how the baby, who was the result of David and Bathsheba's union, that infant died as well. The way we tell that story is that at the end, David repented. So, all things considered, happy ending. If you want a New Testament example, I've got one. And that's the story of Saul. Saul who became Paul. This man who persecuted Christians, threw them in jail, was there the day that the first Christian was martyred, stoned to death. And the Bible tells us that Saul looked on this with approval. But the way we tell the story is that that was just one step in Saul's story, Paul's story. But the good news is he was converted after that, and he became the greatest missionary of all time. It is a story of redemption. It does have something of a happy ending. But I suspect that that was only a little bit of comfort to Stephen's brothers and sisters, to the men that were thrown in prison before Saul became Paul. We're determined, you see, to make sure that every Bible story has a happy ending. That's the way we read it. We want to make sure every biblical story ends happily ever after. The Bible is littered with losses that we try desperately, and sometimes successfully, to turn into lessons. That's why I think that it is Christians who sometimes say the most unfortunate things to people who are grieving. I was at uh, Dory Matson's visitation on Thursday night, saw a few of y'all there as well, and got to hear just a few of those unfortunate things said. Because the truth is, when you're at a place like that, in a time like that, and you get up and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to see a grieving family, to see a husband who's lost his wife, to see children who have lost their mother. You get to the front and you don't know what you're supposed to say. You don't know what you're supposed to say. You want to say something profound. You want to say something comforting. You want to say something encouraging. But in the weight of the moment, nothing feels quite right. So the unfortunate truth is that we people of faith sometimes say the worst stuff. Heaven needed another angel. Don't worry, God never gives you more than you can handle. Well, he's in a better place now. Don't worry, God has a reason for everything. Some of these are just profoundly wrong. God doesn't need anything. But others are right, technically, just not particularly helpful in the moment of grief. But we just can't seem to help ourselves sometimes. In moments of supreme tragedy, we want to make sense of the senseless. When the moment's shrouded in darkness, we just want to open a window and let a little bit of light in. By any means necessary. Just 
whatever it takes to make the shadows disappear. Ours is a faith that brings strength to the powerless, that brings hope to the downtrodden, that brings joy to the brokenhearted. God enables you to endure even the toughest trials. But he doesn't always explain those trials. And he certainly doesn't always eliminate those trials. So when you read this psalm, I want to encourage you, don't speed through the ugly parts. Don't skip over them just so you can get to the pretty stuff. When you live this psalm, don't feel like you have to find the lesson right off the bat. Sit with the sorrow. It's real. If Jesus could cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus could say that, you're allowed to do it too. Those are the most famous words in the psalm. <coughs> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They're the first words of the psalm. And because of that, until you read it all the way through, you kind of start to assume that this psalm is a lament. After all, laments, they're a part of Scripture. They're a genre of the Bible. Jeremiah 20, the prophet says, Cursed be the day I was born. Later on, he wrote a whole book full of lamentations. And in the Psalms, we've got more than half a dozen where it's just the people complaining to God, crying out to him in honest, earnest pleas to take their trouble away. There's something to be said for individual lament and communal lament, for seeking God in the spirit of honest brokenness. But this psalm doesn't stop there. It's not just about lamenting the hard times. It's telling a bigger story. Because the psalmist here, even in the depths of despair, keeps having this this nagging memory. When I think about that idea of nagging memories, I think about when I'm watching a game sometimes. Football game, baseball game, whatever. And it'll be down toward the end, and it looks like my team is not going to pull it out. There's not enough time left. The deficit is too large. They're not going to be able to overcome this. Might as well turn it off, call it a day. But when that happens, I get these nagging memories. I remember that game I saw when I was eight. When the Rangers were down by six runs in the eighth inning, and we thought about going home, and then they pulled it out in the ninth. Or about that high school football game I was at where my school was down by three touchdowns with four minutes to go in the fourth quarter and by some miracle managed to win the game. And so then when I'm watching the game now, no matter how hard others try to convince me it's over, there's not going to be a comeback. No matter how hard I try to convince myself I just can't forget that time I saw a miracle unfold right before my eyes. This psalmist, it seems, has the same experience. Because in verses 1 and 2, he describes this state of forsakenness. God, why have you left me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? But then in verses 3 and 4, I can't help but remember that God was faithful my ancestors. Maybe he'll do it again. Then he bounces back in 6 through 8, describes the way that others are mocking him. How others are saying, call out to your God. He's not going to rescue you. But then he remembers that the truth is, from birth, God has been taking care of him. God has been protecting him. In 12 through 18, in vivid graphic detail, the psalmist describes the dangers that he faces. But then in the face of those dangers, he prays, God, you saved me once. Save me still. <clears throat> so 
So after wrestling with this, the psalm ends a lot differently than it starts. It ends with a call to worship, with a vision for the future, when all will come to God and worship. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. God will rule over all. Brings to mind that verse, Philippians 2.10, <laughs> that someday every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the midst of agony, the writer of this psalm chooses When you read this, the temptation, as I said, is to pass over the ugliness to get to the inspiration. But I think that when you're living this psalm, when your prayer is, God, why have you forsaken me? When you're living it, the struggle is to keep from getting bogged down in the darkness. You can't escape the ugly parts. And you wonder if you ever will. You wish you could skip over the bad parts. You start to wonder if they're just going to last forever. So the temptation then is to cry out from Friday's cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And forget that ours is the God also of Sunday's resurrection. So what do we do with this psalm? That was the question, wasn't it? What do we do with this psalm? With all of its highs and all of its lows. What do we do with it? I think we do what we've done this morning. Read the whole thing. Read it in its entirety. Live the whole thing. Because being conformed to the image of Christ means experiencing both the agony and the ecstasy, both the crucifixion and the resurrection, both the shadows and the sunshine. That's what a full life looks like. And I think that's what Jesus was saying when he cried out from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think it was both. I think that on the one hand, his words were sincere. That having been obedient to the Father, even unto death, he wanted to know where the Father was. Why he was left alone on this cross to die. But if that's all he'd been experiencing, I don't think that this psalm is the one that would have popped into his head. I think his words were faithful too. I think he was thinking about the whole thing. And I think he was proclaiming that in his suffering, his very real suffering, nevertheless, he was choosing hope. With his dying breaths, Jesus was teaching us still. Teaching us that this life is not intended to be easy, but that our suffering is not meaningless. That... Life is not always hopeful, but it is never, ever hopeless. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God brings life out of death. He brings salvation out of suffering. He brings light out of darkness. I'll close with this story about a modern art piece by James Terrell called Hindsight. It's modern art, so you don't just walk up to a painting and look at it and say, oh, that's pretty, and move on. It's an experience. You enter Hindsight by stepping into a narrow corridor. The only source of light is behind you. You walk through this hallway, and quickly you take a hard right turn. As you get farther along, the walls must be painted black because by now the darkness is almost complete. If you go with children, that's the point usually at which they grab your hand a little bit tighter 
If you go alone, that's usually the point when you start looking for a handrail because you cannot see the thing. That expression of holding your hand in front of your face is completely and utterly true. You find the handrail and you feel it bend, and so you follow it along to another 180 degree turn. And the darkness at this point is almost thick, almost palpable. And that's when you put the hand in front of your face to wonder if you can see anything. Make sure you're not about to walk into a wall. Follow the handrail until it reaches its end. And to that point, when you have no sense that the space you have stepped into is a giant room with stadium seating. Not until you reach out and feel the seat in front of you. You find the armrest. You've arrived at the viewing chairs. So you sit and you wait in the blackness. That's what you're instructed to do. But something happens in this complete, overwhelming, all-consuming darkness. You sit there for about 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes or so, your eyes begin to adjust. And in front of you, you start to make something out. And in this darkness, that is when you finally see the art. That is when you see the beauty in the darkness. I don't know what you think about modern art, but I think that one might have something to say. 